That's what we're going to do. Father in heaven, I ask that you would help us today, right now, in your precious and holy name, to shake off our heavy hands and to lift up our holy hands, to recognize that you're the Lord of glory, to recognize that you're our king, to recognize even right now and to receive your love, your grace, and the fullness of God deep down in our hearts. With a, with a longing for you, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be speaking, that your spirit would be encouraging, your spirit would be edifying and helping us to live for you. And we all say it in Jesus, Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Now, as you remember right, that uh, last time that we met, a month ago, the first uh, Wednesday of January, we went over basically one main point to convince you and to make sure that you have a battery information that we live in a spiritual world. That was the number one to set up just how this meeting is going to be, but to also to make sure that every person recognizes and starts looking at life with the understanding, not just with, okay, yeah, okay, I got it, but really the understanding that the world that we live in is a spiritual world, that the things that take place are spiritual, that what is happening and coming to us and what is coming from us is basically at core foundationally in a spiritual realm. What's coming from us and what's coming to us is a spiritual world. That's why you have telltale signs about who you are or who you come across on by, based on what you see. You can tell something about a person by what they drive, the way they act, the way they talk, but oftentimes most people, the majority of people, are doing what to the person who's really inside? They're wearing something. A mask. A mask. One of the great downfalls or of humanity is to walk around with a mask. They, they've been covering up since Adam and Eve. The flesh nature, the self nature has been covering up since Adam and Eve, walking with a mask, portraying something that is not real, re a real manifestation of what's going on inside, but there'll be, there'll be evidences, there'll be manifestations of what's going on at core. You'll see it. If you're looking for it, you'll see it. You'll see what, what, what one person is, pro is projecting is actually a cover-up for the fear that's within. That a person will have fear, or, or maybe a person's uh, looking for the attention of man, uh, even in a church realm, is looking for the attention of man to be seen, to be known as something, uh, to be reputed in some way as somebody spiritual, and will put on a mask of some sort, will project themselves in some way, so that everybody will see them that way. We need to understand that we live in a spiritual world. Uh, again, when you, when you are dealing even at going at a restaurant, or you're, you're in your cars, or you're, uh, you're at home, your kids, everyone we're dealing with and what's happening in our lives is going on in a spiritual realm. It takes uh, Sunday morning service, which was a powerful service. And we had, we had the, Spirit of, uh, the Holy Spirit moved in a very powerful way on people's lives. Some people were perhaps uh, deadened to it that they, there's no movement takes place, or they, they, they don't even understand what's taking place. But we had one older woman sitting over here, Fran, who all of a sudden cried out. Is that not so? And what did she say? And it wasn't just, you know, you know, me, uh, you know, garçon, you know. <laughs> I, I need prayer over here. Uh, or, you know, I'm not feeling well. There was an urgency and there was a desperation, true? And it was stated in such a way that her voice gave telltale sign of what's going on inside. I need prayer. But how many caught that that really was not just Fran? But that was the Holy Spirit's cry for our church. That was the Holy Spirit's cry for our church. We need prayer. There's a, there's a crying, a moaning that takes place and that her spirit cried out, Prayer! We need the Holy Spirit. There's a calling upon and a need that we, that's going on. There's a spiritual realm and a dynamic that's taken place that, a, that we need to tap in, we need to rely on, we need to fall upon the loving arms of Christ Almighty. So we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is here for us and that's evidence right there that took place out of an older woman saying, I need prayer, not even herself really knowing that that's the Spirit's cry. But that's what took place. Now when we look at this, this is a study of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, of course, is dealing with the entire spiritual realm and we're taking it in a, basically a nine-fold 
outline, which as I gave you last time is the person of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit are the first three that we're going to cover one of them tonight, the person of the Holy Spirit. The person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit. The next outline will be the character, the conduct, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. We certainly won't cover all of those in one night, that's for sure. As a matter of fact, this could end up being a book for each one of them. But there's the person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit that we need to understand. There's the character, the conduct, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the governance of the Holy Spirit, and the glory of the Holy Spirit. If we are able in the year 2006 to lay the foundation and grasp the, the elements, the foundation of, uh, of what's taken place in those nine categories, and with understanding, you'll have a solid, uh, you'll have a solid uh, approach to what's going on in the spirit world as well as your relationship with the Holy Spirit. If somebody's got those nine, they're going to understand the things of the Spirit much better. So that's what we want to begin is tonight, is the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, oftentimes with the person of the Holy Spirit, the question often arises is, what is the Holy Spirit? The correct question should be what? We covered it last time. Who? Who is the Holy Spirit? Not what, but who is the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is a person. Is a person. You know, you don't want anybody coming up to you and saying, what's your wife? You know, like, what is your wife? It's like, you know, it's who is your wife, but not a what? You know, the who. There's a person connected to it. And so when we're looking at this, we need to understand that if we, if we think of the Holy Spirit as just a power, as just an influence, as an energy, if we think of the Holy Spirit in that way, we'll start going as to, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? That person will start thinking as a, as a power. I want more power. Do you remember in the, the book of Acts in the beginning where there's a, there's a man, Simon, who's looking for what? How can I get more? How can I get this Holy Spirit? How can I get this power, this influence? That's the wrong question. Now, if, you, if you're looking and saying, well, that's what I want. I want to get more of the Holy Spirit. I want, to get, I want to get that power, that influence. Really, it should not be, the, the thinking should not be, how can I get more of the Holy Spirit? The correct question, because it's a person, is how can the Holy Spirit get a hold of me? How can he get more of me? We're the problem, not him. See, we oftentimes are looking at it as a power or as an influence and that we want the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go after him. And you do. But in your quest for the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be how can you get more of his power and his energy and his authority. It's going to be how, what, how can I let him, how can I allow him, how can I yield in such a way that the Holy Spirit will get more of me. He'll shake you out good. The Holy Spirit will shake us out. Anybody ever pick up a cat or a dog by the nap of the neck? A little kitty or something, and you, you could shake, he'll shake us out. He's, we're under his control. And that's the part that, that bothers us. So a person will instead hang on to themselves. Because they don't want to have the Holy Spirit get too much of who they are. And so we're looking and saying that, if we're looking and saying, I'm looking for to get the Holy Spirit, I want to get more of his powers and energy, we start going into more of the self mode. We want to get into self-realization and self-sufficiency and, and I want more and we start we want to control the power and the authority and so because we want to get what he is. What we want instead is for him to get more of us. Control me. That you get me. Remember, he's a consuming fire. He's a consuming God. He consumes. He he takes in all that you are. Our quest, our task is to release ourselves to who he is. Is to yield ourselves to him where that it's, it's none of us, it's all of him. It's none of us, it's all of him. The Holy Spirit, he's not crucifying half of Gary. He's crucifying all of Gary. Christ wasn't half crucified, he was fully crucified. Sending a message to us all that the that the flesh nature has no place in the economy of God. We just need to understand that. So instead, when we're saying we're yielding ourselves to him fully and wholly, 
it will be that the flesh nature, self nature, the first Adam person born will be none of him, none of her, push aside, and instead all of me is wrapped up, the new creation in Christ in the Holy Spirit. And we're operating as his ambassadors and as his bringing reconciliation, as his representatives that we hear and then we do. And that's where the authority is. That's where the power is. Now, the key to know the Holy Spirit is to begin with understanding that we know him as a person, that we know him as a person. He is a person to be known. Please hear me now. He is a person to be known. He's a person to be known. Now, this is the beauty of it. He wants to be known. If God did not want to be known, who would not know him? <laughs> All of us. That the entire Old Testament shows that until he came to the Gentiles, they could search in vain. They weren't finding him. The Gentiles were not able to find God, no matter what superstitious realm they went down, no matter what temple, no matter how they tried to accomplish it, they weren't finding God. But yet he revealed himself to one people. He wants and he revealed to them one, this one great thought, and you really need to hang on to this, and make sure people understand it. God wants to be known. He wants to be known. He wants to be understood. He wants us to know. I know I want my kids to know me. They, I don't want them to just know me as the dad who provides. As, you know, when you, when you have a need, call upon dad. Dad, I need a hundred bucks to send it. I'm not looking for just dad the provider. I want to be known as who I am to my children. I would think that you want to be known. I'm, I'm not wanting to have a relationship with my wife that we're just just uh, cohabitating or that we're just uh, protecting one another or that uh, she cooks the meals and I bring home the bacon and we're not looking for that. There's a, I want her to know me. Not the mask. Know me. And I want her to know me and I want to know her. Well in the same way I want my kids to know who I am as their father, as their friend, my character, my conduct, my concerns. I want them to know who I am. You perhaps want to know some of your neighbors and maybe some of them you don't want to know right or you want to know them only so far I have certain family members that I want to would like to know more and and others that you that you know you're only gonna know them so far they've drawn lines you're not gonna know them as, as close so we have to understand that there's that God Almighty has not drawn a line instead he is placed a foundation. The foundation is called Christ, the cornerstone. And on that, he says, I can be known. On that foundation, I can be known. Interesting, isn't it? That God Almighty, the one who created you, wants you to know him. And so in this, remember what does it say in the New Testament that, that now we know God, then he goes, yet rather that we are now known by God. Do you ever see that in, in, in Scripture? That we now know him, and then he kind of says, yet rather it's that rather you are now known by God. That God now knows you. He, he's, he recognizes you. He's placed a, a name on you that you now have a place in his economy. So we have to realize that as a person, he wants to be known. Now when you're thinking of a person, how is it that we know people? How is it that you know the person next to you? When you say, I want to know someone, and we're in this church going to get to know more and more people, how is it that you know a person? Spend more time with them. Talk with them. So you spend more time with them, you talk with them, anything else? You, so if, uh, if a new person comes in, and they came one, one time to church, I got their name, and I came to you and I said, by the way, that person's name is Sam. Next time that person walks in, you would say, there's Sam. But do you know him? See, a lot of people know God that way. Oh, there's the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's the Holy Spirit. Oh, I spoke in tongues, or I did this, or we saw a healing, or oh, there's the Holy Spirit. 
So there's a recognition by what we've seen. There's a recognition by the name. So I say the Holy Spirit and everybody says, that's right, yep. But do we really know the Holy Spirit? Now, let's say that you go on that same day and you go and shake that man's hand, Sam. And Sam stands there and looks at you and you look at him and you're both uncomfortable with each other because you're not sure what to say next. And so Sam's kind of floundering for words and you're kind of floundering for words and somebody's got to break the ice. Or else nobody's ever going to know each other. They're just not going to know each other. So oftentimes, what's one of the first things that we attempt to start doing? What do you do? What do you do? Because we have, we've got to know people by what they do. So we, what do you do? What do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm in construction. Oh, so you bang nails. Uh, well, I'm actually a kitchen, kitchen uh, uh, cabinet maker and this and that. Oh, uh, so bang nails is probably not the right way. Uh, you know, so we start trying to get to know who that person is by what they do. So the next time that you meet Sam, Sam has a little bit more uh, a knowledge. You have a little bit more knowledge of them. And we start breaking down and realizing that, asking a few questions and inquiring. So all of a sudden somebody comes up alongside and you say, by the way, this is Sam. This is Carol. And so now those two have, but now they don't know each other. But you know Carol and you now know Sam, but you're trying to now introduce. Now that person walks up, Carol walks up, but you decided with Sam not to talk to Carol. Not going to. Now how's Carol going to feel? Snubbed, right? Kind of pushed them off to the side, ignoring them. Just keep on your conversation. That this person wants to maybe know Sam or wants to, why are you keeping me excluded? But there comes a time where we need to reach out and realize that the Holy Spirit wants to be known, not just, oh, that's Sam. But there's an interaction that takes place, not merely just a description. Many people know the Holy Spirit by description, not by interaction. When they start sensing interaction, they're going to go back into description. Can't I just define him? See, we keep looking for a description. God keeps trying to give us a prescription. We're always looking for a list to describe him. God instead keeps getting in front. We keep putting our head down to, to write down who he is in our heart. And he keeps standing in front of us. I'm here. Get to know me. See me at work. Well, the place to begin is to realize, first of all, there's a spiritual realm. Second of all, this great God Almighty, this Holy Spirit, has set up home in you. And he wants to be known, not just identified. He's not looking to just be described. He's looking to have interaction with who we are and with others. His heart is to be known and his heart is to be made known. His heart is to no be known and his heart is to be made known. So everything that we're doing is going into a description process and also an interaction process because we want to know him. Now, when a person is described, think of it now, we describe a person. So, take my wife for instance. So, if I, if, I, if I had a marker board, and we will have a marker board, I could make a list and say, okay, now everyone in this room, give me one word that describes my wife. That's a dangerous thing now, isn't it? <laughs> uh, now, isn't that dangerous, right? <laughs> to you or to her. But we, we're going to go through and describe. Somebody all of a sudden may say, all right, I'm going to describe um, long hair, uh, brown hair. Uh, green sweater. And we could go through and list to describe who she is. Uh, nice, uh, polite, uh, loving. Um, we could go through and make some, some notification. Now if somebody came in new and looked at that list and says, oh okay, I know who that is. Based on that list, I, that's that person right there. Now what's the telltale sign? What's the telltale sign to know if what we have described is true. What's the telltale sign to know that what we've described is true? Somebody now wants to go up and meet her and if that list doesn't match up, what is it? 
If that list doesn't match up, it's not her. It's not her or, or the line. The list is, somebody's not seeing it correctly, right? You can tell when you start interacting then as to whether it's true. When you start interacting and spending a time with someone, you start realizing as to what was defined, what was described, is it true? Well, we can go through and read the Bible. Let's go through and read the Bible, read the Bible, and see all the times the Holy Spirit has moved on someone's life, that God Almighty has saved or empowered, or, and we've seen all these things, and we've read it, and we see it. But every, everything I, that I have that deals with God, everything that's going on, nothing's lining up. Something's wrong. Either I'm not perceiving him correctly, or, right, or I'm not interacting with God. We want to make sure that, that always, that when you're dealing with God, that, that you understand who he is, the description, the definition. But when you're interacting with him, we're always looking and making sure that it's aligning with who he revealed himself to be. Because he revealed himself in scripture interacting with people. He didn't just... Bring someone alone in a cave somewhere, told them to take out a pen and paper and write down who I am. True? Is this making sense? He didn't just bring someone in a cave, write down, take out some paper, and spend three weeks and write down everything that I am. And then go and profess, this is who I am. Rather, over 1,500 years through a variety of authors, going through with a variety of kings and nations, he revealed who he was by interacting with humanity. The record that we have to understand who he is, how he responded, how he acted, how he, how he um, um, uh, moved against with wrath, what he extended his love towards, uh, how he feels towards things, what, he, what grieves him. And we keep seeing what faith is, what holiness is, what righteousness is. If it wasn't for the Old Testament, would we really understand what righteousness is and what faith is? And because the New Testament keeps referring to all of those examples. It's through the interaction of the Holy Spirit among humanity and among people where we get to see who He is. Hence, all the more reason to understand our Bibles. Because to not read, to not, all, you're, all we're doing is just taking what's been described, but we're not, in, we're not interacting with him ourselves personally. That, I'll tell you this, that every week, every month, you should be having experiences with God. As a matter of fact, I would dare say, every day, you should be having an interaction with God. You should be hearing him, seeing him, sensing his presence, Jesus should be on your mind. If you go a day without Jesus on your mind, something's wrong. Jesus should be on your mind, on your heart. God Almighty would be impressing his character, his mindset, his concerns, who he is, should be manifesting. He'll even put you in check in certain ways or certain things that you said and, and snip it on you. And you should be interacting with God on a regular basis. Not to means something's wrong with your understanding of who he is in your life. As saying and praying for a church of the Holy Spirit, we're praying that God would move powerfully in our midst, not just an occasional goosebump up and down the spine. Unfortunately, that's what many people are just looking for. I just want those like Holy Ghost goosebumps, like, ooh, like, oh, there he is. Rather, we're looking for movements of the Holy Spirit that are inspiring us and igniting our passion, igniting our faith to want to live for Him. This is what we're looking for. So when we're looking and saying, who is the Holy Spirit in our lives? It comes by revelation. It's the record has been written, but also through personal experience as it corresponds with that revelation. He revealed Himself interacting with humanity. He revealed Himself interacting with people. So He's going to interact with you. He didn't just say, now here it is, now learn the book. So that we have some cognitive knowledge. Rather, we want to experience God. Somebody can talk about God, but boy, when somebody has experienced Him, there's power. There's power. Because when you have that, that in you, like, I've had an experience with God, whereas maybe He set you free from something that was dominating your life or inspired you with new faith or where you actually maybe told someone about the Lord and they got saved right before you, converted right before you. 
that just inspires your faith to want to tell someone else. But if you're just telling people, read the book, read the book, in the hopes that they finally can quote the same verse that you're quoting, it just doesn't click. It doesn't take place. Now, in this, we need to realize that who is the Holy Spirit? In going through the biblical record and realizing our personal interaction and as he has interacted with people in time past, we need to look at as a person, as a person, who he is. That's what we're going to do. As a person, who he is. Interacting, revealing himself. The first thing we need to realize, number one, he's a holy person. He's a holy person. Now, doesn't that sound simple? So, now, anyone here, would, no one would disagree with that, right? That's why they call him the Holy Spirit. So we would look and realize that he's a holy person. We understand what a person is. He's a person. Now we want to look and see he's a holy person. Now when we're looking and saying, all right, what does holy mean? What does a holy person mean? He's a holy person. I think there's three words that captivate, that, that really explain Hence, I'll use the word define or describe that I can grab out of the Bible that best describes holiness, the holy person of God. Number one, and, you, and this is, these, are, these three, I really think you need to capture and make part of your vocabulary in describing who the Holy Spirit is because it will help you to explain Him and to understand what He's doing in your life. Number one, He's transcendent. As a holy person... He is transcendent. What does transcendent mean? He is transcendent. T-R-A-N-S-C-E-N-D-E-N-T. -E -E transcendent. Uh, can't be contained? Uh, not so much. Um, transcendent. Does anybody remember uh, Henry David Thoreau? Where is he? Transcendentalization. Transcendent means he's high and lifted up. High and lifted up. Now, why didn't I just say that? Well, he's high and lifted up. But transcendent, he transcends all things. There is nothing even close to him. He is above all things. There's nothing that is equal to him. When you're thinking transcendent, it means without equal. Without equal. Also, as transcendent, without a creator. Now, think of that. Transcendent. Above all things, without equal, and without a creator. Now, you and I, we have a creator. Yes? Anybody says no, you're in trouble. Okay? <laughs> we have a creator. So, we have a hard time thinking of God as not having a creator. Because our mindset is we're created. Everything around us is created. Therefore, we have a hard time picturing, envisioning God as not having a creator. And we say we can't understand, we can't grasp that, we can't bring that information down into our realm. And we have trouble with that, and you can fight with it till now, till the cows come home, and you're still going to be struggling with it. And you say, well, why does it have to be that way? I have a homework assignment for you. Go to the local beaver lodge down at the dam and start telling them about 2 plus 2 equals 4. And tell me if they care. Start, start getting them to understand calculus. Talk to them about art. Talk to them about why don't they put an addition on and bring in a kitchen designer. <laughs> Go down to the local beaver lodge and spend a night and see if they are going to prepare a meal for you. Maybe put on a skyscraper if they put on a better foundation when they blow the, blow the dam that their house won't go down with it. See, the, the beaver doesn't care. The beaver's not even concerned with where you are tonight. The deer don't care, the squirrels don't care, the robins don't care, the ravens don't care, the dolphins don't care, the whales don't care. The whales don't even care that they're bigger, the blue whales don't care that they're bigger than the elephants. They really don't care. 
That's, it's meaningless to them. Why? It's, it's information that is not in there. They, they, they don't concerned with that. Chipmunks are concerned with hiding 100% of their nuts so they can find 50. That's their whole life, their whole concern. And they know they're not going to lose most of them, so they hide more. And as a matter of fact, to say that they know that, they don't even know that. They just do it. To say that they know that is not so. They don't know that. They just do that. That's what they're built for. So for, for, for them to think, now think you have the ability to think transcendent, high and lofty, above, without equal. Beavers, deers, whale, squirrel, mice, moles, they don't think that way. This is information that is above and it what transcends them. It's above them. They don't care of it. They don't look towards it. And there's things that go on in the heavenly realm. There's things that go on in the spiritual realm. There's things that go on in the economy of God. There's things that he has prepared that go beyond this world that he has not yet revealed. But I can assure you of this. It will transcend anything you ever have experienced. Transcend meaning it will go far above and beyond anything that you ever even remotely thought possible as being part of your life. And God just merely says, it's that good. You want it. He's talking about an age to come. He's talking about kingdoms to come. He's talking about a new heaven and a new earth when we're just trying to have a hard time just figuring out the one we're in. And he's bringing a whole new one. Don't bother. We can learn from the ant. We can learn from the sluggard. They don't learn from us. The Bible says, go to the ant, you sluggard, and learn. We learn from them. They don't learn from us. So when we're realizing that the world that we're living in, that God Almighty is above all things. He transcends all things. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And our ways are not His ways. And yet He wants our ways to be his way, <laughs> right? Because he wants us to transcend our old ways. Get above them. Take the high road. Stop being that way. Get out of those beggarly elements. Start dealing with the greater, without equal, God's mentality that transcend those things. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. Look what he says here. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. What's he say here? For thus says the High and lofty one. Who's saying that? For thus says the high and lofty one. Who's describing who? Is not God describing himself as the high and lofty one? He knows who he is. And he is revealing to us who he is. He's the one who transcends all things. And he's described himself as high and lofty. How many? One. One. <laughs> High and lofty. Now, he didn't use words transcendent and he didn't use, uh, he's using words that we would understand. He's using high and lofty. High and lifted up. We sing those songs without realizing that means he's without equal. He's above all things. He's without creator. He's above all things. There's nothing that is equal with the high and lofty one. That's what he's saying. And what does he inhabit? Eternity. He inhabits eternity. He's clothed himself in eternity. He lives in eternity. Whose name is? Holy. How is it? What's his name? Is it Sam? Carol? Oh, his name is Jesus? Yes, Jesus meaning what? What does Jesus mean, literally? 
Savior. His name is reflecting what he does, who he is. He doesn't just save, he is the Savior. He doesn't just offer peace, he is peace. He doesn't just offer holiness, he is holy. And he is high and lifted up. He inhabits, inhabits eternity. I dwell in the high and holy place. Where does he dwell? In the high place and in the holy place. Interesting how all through Old Testament, where does everyone continually want to go to worship God or gods? The high place. The high place. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when, he would, when anyone going to worship at the temple, would go up to Jerusalem. The mount. The high place. The transcendent place. The place that's high and lifted up. Getting to where God is in, in high and lifted up. There was always this mentality of getting as close to God who's high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity. I dwell in the high and holy place, he said. And then he says something that I have to, I have to go into, which is a couple of sermons in itself, but not for tonight. But it says in verse 15b, I dwell in the highly pla high place with who? See, wait a minute now. He says, I'm opening up this high-end place, this lofty place, I, eternity place. I'm opening it up to someone. Think of it now. God Almighty, the Holy One, high and lifted up, lofty, has said, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, says, I am going to live, inhabit, I'm going to open the doors to someone. And let them, allow them, permit them to do what? Live with Him. Exist with him. And that's what he's saying in this verse. But he describes now who that person is. Oh, that's Joe. Oh, that's Carol. Oh, that's Sam. Sam can come up. I like Sam. Sam's a good guy. No, that's not what he's saying, is it? No? He's not looking and saying it's Sam, it's Joe, it's Carol, it's Diane. It's, it, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Put any name you want on it. But anyone who's got that, that's where they're going. Because you know why? Nobody has that unless the Holy Spirit is working on them. Nobody, nobody, now that's a big word. Nobody has a humble and contrite spirit as defined and described in the Bible unless the Holy Spirit is doing a work in their life. Nobody. Instead, they are, the Bible describes that person who's not holy and contrite, instead will be high and lifted up where? In their own heart. In their own heart. They'll be high and lifted up in their own heart. That's where he calls them proud. They walk arrogance. They're puffed up. Right? The Bible constantly calls because they're highly high, high, and mind, high minded in their own mind. In their own heart they're high minded. They've lifted themselves up. That's why the Lord says that the way up is the way down. Humble. The low road. As a matter of fact he says rather than going into a banquet and placing yourself in a position of prominence. What does he say to do? Instead, come in and put yourself in the lowly position and wait for the master to bring you up. But the person who comes in and says, well, gee, you know, I've got this sticker that says I'm somebody. Look at it. I've got this right here. I'm, I'm someone. And so, you know, well, don't you know I'm pastor of the Mary Mac Valley Church and I'm going to go down to that, that big center and we're going to have a big meeting. And don't they know that that church down there, I'm just going to walk in and I sit at the head table and I'm going to just be with everyone. And all of a sudden somebody comes and says, no, that seat's reserved for someone else. And move me down. High-minded and lofty in my own mind, in my own heart, in my own position, in my own abilities. Move down. Instead, come in with the low way. Now, what does contrite mean? Contrite. What does contrite mean? Well, it says, so it doesn't say humble and humble. Right? It says, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. What does contrite? No. Uh, kind of, listen now, this is the difficult part, and this is where it all begins. Contrite, a deep sense of one's own sinfulness. Contrite, a deep sense of one's own sinfulness. Oh God, help me, a sinner. Instead of, thank you Lord, I'm not like that worthless man. 
See the difference? That God gave us that humble and contrite spirit scenario when the two men came to worship, one beating his brow, Oh God, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a broken man. I've, and there's the other guy saying, Thank you God that I'm not like that man there. Lifted up in his own mind, not contrite, not humble, and according to God's word, isn't going to exist in eternity with him. But the man who's crying out with a contrite heart, David, when, he, when Nathan came to him and said, Thou art the man. What happened to David? No, I'm not. Don't you know that when I looked out and she was there and I'm the king, is that what he did? You know? When Nathan came to David and he described what took place with Bathsheba using a story, and David had taken Bathsheba for himself. He's the king of all and here's a prophet coming in and all of a sudden points to him and says, Thou art the man. And it cut to his heart. He could have put on instead a garment of pride or arrogance or pomp and says, well, it's all right, I'm the king and I can have what I want. And the Bible says that the king can, is going to take whatever he wants. And instead he was cut to the heart. Oh God, I have sinned. Contrite and humble. That's the person. Now, that only comes by way of the Holy Spirit. No one, but no one can get a humble and contrite spirit except by calling upon God to come into their life. I remember the events God coming upon Gary Cody and, and crushing me with his grace. Did you hear what I said? Crushing me with his grace. He does crush, but he crushes with grace. He crushes not as to squash the petals of flower so it's nothing. He crushes that it might bloom again fresh and new. He crushes with grace that we might have an understanding of our own sinfulness. That's the person high and lifted up. When we're looking at that, Colossians 3.2 preached a sermon on that. What was it? Set your mind on things above. Transcendent mind. He's calling for us to have what? A mind that is above the things of this earth. Set your mind on things above, Colossians 3.2, not on things of the earth. So what is the Bible telling us? What is God revealing to us? Get our minds to be high-minded thinking, not high-mindedness, high-minded thinking. I'm seeking the things that are above, not the things on the earth. Because to do that is to place ourselves in the beggarly elements of the old man that is not transcendent, but is just commonplace. So he says, put your mind and put your heart on that which is of him. Transcendent. You want to have this mindset that is no longer thinking the physical realm, but is thinking the spiritual realm, and is going past the, the desire to know angels. You want to know the Holy Spirit. You want to go to the high place. You want to go the highest there is. You want to go to the high and lofty one. That's what you're looking for. Number two, to describe the holy person. To describe the holy person. Number two, he's separate. He is separate. With transcendent, he's above all things. With separate, he is from all things. Transcendent, he's above all things. Separate is from all things. No one, no one is like him. He is separate from all things. Do you remember in Matthew, he's going to separate the nations? He's the one who separates those that are with him and those that aren't. There's this whole mindset that even in the tabernacle, what was constantly being, being uh, uh, shown, illustrated, separate. With the nation being, Israel being called out to be their own nation. You shall not be like the other nations. You are separate unto me, my own possession. To be holy and to be a holy person is to be separated from that which is commonplace, that which is not of God. To separate from... How many times have you heard me say, separate yourself from all those things that are not Him and separate yourself to that which is Him? Because if we're not under His dominion, we're under the dominion that's something that's not Him. So we're always in this battle, we're always in this flex that we want to instead... And now your old nature doesn't want to go there. So it's battling all the time, battling. There's not one moment that you're ever existing, conscious or unconscious, that some battle has not taken place. Always battling, those two. 
And your call is to set your mind on things above, to separate from that which is of this earth, and to set our mind on that which is of God. To allow ourselves to realize that God says, present yourselves as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice is a big word, yes? Sacrifice. Now, we have to put sacrifice, not like, you know, I tease my wife all the time, oh, you know, sacrificing and stuff. But sacrifice, you go back to the Old Testament days, that's sacrifice. Whereas you take the best of your flock and you, you take it down and you spread it out and you tear it apart. And, and he's showing us what, the, there's a sacrifice involved. And he says, separate yourself, be a living sacrifice separate yourself, be a living sacrifice unto God. God Almighty as a holy person has separ is separate from all things and he's calling for his people to be separate. Hebrews 7.26. Would you look there? Hebrews 7.26. Hebrews 7.26. The writer of Hebrews talking about the great high priest, Christ Jesus. Makes this statement that kind of brings it together. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 says, For such a high priest, meaning Christ Jesus, was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. There's the transcendent aspect. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26. Holy, separate, and higher is all in one verse. He's high and lifted up. He's separate from all things, and he's calling for us as our high priest, leading the way, leading the charge, making intercession for us, opening that gate and saying, and this is what I have for you. Do the same thing. But you can't do it in your power, old nature power. Instead, it is the new man in Christ calling upon the power of the Lord, saying, and now there's, I, need, I need you, Lord, and I want to separate from the old, and I want to enter the new. You and I, you and I cannot do this in anything of the old flesh nature. We cannot, cannot do it. It, it is impossible to please God that way. Cannot do it. We need to realize that God is separating us from that we might be separated to. Do you remember back in the days of the Civil War? When the Civil War, the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation took place, where uh, the, the uh, Northern Presidency came forth and, and set the, the slaves free. Just said, you're free. True. And the war ended, war, the war ended, 1865, and you're free. Were they? No. Right? So they're separated from but they weren't separated to anything. We're free from something, but we have to be free to something. If you're free, now what do I do? I'm, all right, I'm just gonna kinda walk around and nobody's hiring me, nobody wants me, I'm not treated equal, I've got no place to go, I'm not welcome, there's no hospitality, there's no, so I can be separated from something or I can be free from something to just what, be left in limbo in this gray area of having nothing to, nobody welcoming, nobody extending, no privileges, no rights, no responsibilities. Uh, oh, I can hire you at a slave's wage, so you can call me free, but I'm not. We are free from, but you therefore must continue and complete that thought, and you're free to. I repent from, that I repent Two, I turn from one thing, I'm automatically facing something else. I separate from something, I'm separated to something. So when God Almighty, who is separate from all things, starts separating us from our old habits, our old ways, to do what? Nothing? No, to pick up new habits and renew your mind is what the Bible says, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2, to renew our minds. So we have to leave the old and cling to the new. Well, the Holy Spirit has revealed that He is high and above all things, but He is separate also from all things. Number three, and lastly, to describe that He's a holy person. Number three, 
He's perfect. He's perfect. He is perfect. Now you and I have a hard time perhaps understanding or defining perfect. Oftentimes people have said, well, I'm a perfectionist. No, you're not. You're driven for perfection, but you're not a perfectionist. You're trying to maybe manage everything so that it goes according to what you think is right, but you're not perfect. As a matter of fact, one of the very things that people always say in order to escape any type of, of trap that they've been confronted about something they did wrong, when they don't know what else to say, will say what? I'm not perfect. All right, now that we've got that covered, we know. Everyone knows that. Nobody is. But it's the great catch-all when we're trapped and have no place else to go. Someone will say, well, I'm not perfect. That's a gimme. But, so we have a hard, hard time understanding really what is perfect because we've never seen it. We've never experienced it. We've ne we can't even define it. We've never had it. But yet the perfect one has set up home in you. The perfect one, the holy one, has set up home in you. The perfect one has made himself known. And if it's one thing that you will start seeing in your life as you grow with the Lord, he's perfect and you're not. <laughs> True? So we start seeing that, that he has a love about him and we don't. He has a peace about him and we don't. He has a grace and a mercy and a long-suffering and a goodness to him and a softness. And we don't. We're calloused. We're hard. We're demanding. We're commanding. We're prideful. We're, we're high and minded in our own. We're lazy. We're, we're soft. We're weak. We're weepy. We, we cry. We, we, we're shy. We're timid. We're fearful. We're greedy. And he's none of that. He's perfect. We're looking at this idea of perfect. He's perfect in all things. Transcendent, above all things. Separate, from all things. Perfect, in all things. If you can capture that, above all things, from all things, in all things. He's transcendent, he's separate, and he's perfect. When we're talking about now what holiness is, think of it now. He's 100% holy. 100%. 100% holy. That means in everything that he is, 100% holy. Everything that he does, 100% holy. Everything that he will do must also be holy. Has to be, 100% holy. Has to be. That's why he says back even in the Old Testament and carried all the way through the, through the Bible, he said, be holy as I am holy. Now, how can that be? I'm not. And yet the command came forth, be holy as I am holy. The first response should have been, I can't. Exactly. Everything you commanded us, we will do. That's what the Hebrew said. Right. That lasted a night. Be holy is the command of God. To be minded like Him above all things. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Separate from those things that are not of Him. We therefore need to learn what's Him and what's not Him. To just go by mom's and grandma's traditions isn't going to cut it. Well, it's the way I was brought up. It's the way it's always been. Doesn't mean it's Him. Well, it's what the pastor said. Better make sure the pastor's preaching the word. Got to be on target. Got to be above all things, from all things, in all things, calling for us to be perfect. And one thing you'll realize that in this world, you and I will keep falling short. But we should keep growing in our perfection and in our completion and in our understanding. That's what he's called us to do. He's calling for us to be holy in everything that we do. He's calling for us to be holy. All that he does, everything that he's after is to make us a holy people. Now, think of it. Here's a perfect understanding of understanding. Back in the days of Genesis, Adam and Eve created. How? In the, in the image 
of God himself. Yes? They were a people that were created. And then God brought them through a process. Adam, name all the animals. Listen now. Adam, name all the animals. Get to know them. Not just label them. Know them. Know them. In getting to know the animals, he comes up with a great conclusion. What's the conclusion? There's no one like me. He is... There's no one like me. Think of it now. This, this, if you catch this, he is above all things. He's transcendent above the creation. There's no one like him. There's no one that is like me. I'm separated from them. And he has also been made perfect. He's a holy being. Made in the image of God. No one, no one could govern the creation. No animal could govern the creation like who? Adam. He's the only one who had the ability, the capability, the aptitude that was made for authority. That was made. That was designed. That he alone could have authority over all things. He's the only one who could, who could control and, and rule over all things. He's the one who was made in the image of God. He was above all things. He was separated, none like him. And he was perfect. He was a holy being. This was made in the image of God. One with intellect. One with will. One with conscience. Understanding. Law. This holy being is what he was as in the image of God. So when we're talking about the holy person. Now, and to end it here and is that what is therefore God when he is in you today? What is it that he wants to do in my heart, in your heart, and in everyone else's? Being the, in light of what we talked about, the holy person, what is it that he, in operating in your life, your heart, your mind, your soul, your life, your past, your present, your future, your family, your job, what is it that he wants to do in your life? Make you holy. Get us above, separate us from, and make us perfect. That's what he's looking to do in your life and my life. Now, that just doesn't just, that doesn't just happen. That just doesn't just say, well, I, I, I prayed the prayer. Why isn't it happening? You know, like, we're looking for magic one God. You know, well, if he wanted me this way, he'd just do it. No, if you wanted it this way, you'd pursue it. Well, if he wanted it this way, he'd just do it. No. If you wanted it this way, you'd pursue it. But that's your excuse to stay the way that you are.